Hey, uh, is anyone short on cash? Well, solve the following equation, or rather prove the existence and uniqueness of any possible solution to this equation that we're going to talk about today, and you could win a million bucks for it. What equation am I talking about? I'm talking about the Navier-Stokes equations. And it's one of uh, a handful of equations that there's a so-called millennium prize for, where if you prove the, uh, if you solve some proof or come up with a counterexample related to some unsolved problem in mathematics, then they'll give you a million bucks for it. And the Navier-Stokes is one of them. So we can't, we we have come up with we being a society, we have come up with solutions to uh, very particular examples of the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, but general a general proof of the solution in any um, for, for any given flow is actually um, an unsolved problem well I'm not here today to talk about million dollar prizes and uh, the Navier-Stokes equations but I'm here to give you an intro to the Navier-Stokes equations and how it can be useful to solve problems in biofluids so let's get started So what are the Navier-Stokes equations? The Navier-Stokes equations are essentially conservation of momentum. Um, for a fully micro control volume. So if you look back at the last lecture, if you look back at the last lecture, we said, you know, what is this fully micro control volume? For the last lecture, we said, hey, what if I had some uh, some control volume, and instead of making some of the dimensions macro and some of them micro, what if I made all three of the dimensions? What if I made it a tiny little cube, and I made all three of the dimensions of this control volume micro, in the sense that there is a delta x, a delta y, and a delta z, and last time, what we did was conservation of mass for this, for this particular control volume. And we went from the macro version uh, uh, of a control volume, which was basically um, the time derivative of an integral over the volume of rho dv is equal to minus an integral over the surface of rho times v dot n dA. So this was this was conservation of mass. And we we took this equation, applied it to a fully microcontrol volume, took some appropriate limits, and we ended up with the following equation. D, d rho dt, or time derivative of density, uh, plus d rho vx dx plus d rho vy dy plus d rho vz dz. The sum of these was equal to zero. And this was, this was so conservation of mass, so macro conservation of mass. We applied it to this control volume. We went, um, uh, and then we got a micro. We we basically went from a uh, a, a bunch of derivatives and integrals and dot products to a partial differential equation, and it turns out you can sort of follow a similar methodology for Navier-Stokes, where instead of applying conservation of mass to this fully micro control volume you apply conservation of momentum to it. So if we have macro conservation of momentum, macro conservation of momentum looks something like this. It's like d dt of an integral over the volume of velocity times rho dv, which is equal to an integral minus an integral over the surface of velocity times, dens or velocity times density times v dot n dA plus the sum of any external 
externally applied forces to the control volume. So, uh, so it turns out that you know if you have conservation, conservation of mass, um, you can go from this to this. If you uh, if you then instead do conservation of momentum, your macro version looks like this. And if you go fully micro on conservation of momentum, you get the Navier-Stokes equations, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, in previous versions, you know, the very first time I taught a fluid mechanics class, um, I devoted two lectures to going from here to the to the Navier-Stokes equations, and it was a waste of time, and I don't think anyone really found it very helpful. So, what am I going to do today? I'm not going to do this derivation. You know, I think the derivation of conservation of mass was enough for everyone. I'm not going to do this derivation. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plop down the Navier-Stokes equations, and in particular, the x component, right? This is a vector equation, so it has an x and a y, a z, and a, uh, an x, a y, and a z component. I'm going to do the x version. Uh, I'm going to do the x component. And we're going to do a thorough walkthrough. I'm going to explain what all of these terms mean. I'm going to give physical intuitions, and I'm going to describe where these things come from. So I would rather, I would much rather you build strong intuitions and understand what each of the terms of the Navier-Stokes equations mean rather than be able to derive it yourself. You know, and we can do so in less time overall. So if you're with me, stay tuned. Let's talk about the uh, the terms in the Navier-Stokes equations, where they come from, what they mean physically and how they might um, show up and be used in flows. And then if you hang on with me to the very end, once I've sort of explained this, this whole, you know, where, where all the terms in this Navier-Stokes equations come from and what they mean, um, we'll do an example problem where we start with the Navier-Stokes equations and we, uh, and in particular the x component of the Navier-Stokes equations, and we end up using this Navier-Stokes equation to derive a velocity profile. So for example, you know, in um, when we did shells problems, we used conservation of momentum on a shell to derive velocity profiles. And you know, the Navier-Stokes equations and the continuity equation, or the fully micro versions of these things, are essentially just alternatives to to shells problems. So, you know, they basically accomplish the same thing as shells problems. They enable us to derive velocity profiles given nothing. So we no longer rely on Professor Landon's face, you know, the clouds opening up, Professor Landon's face coming through and telling you a velocity profile is such and such. Um, we now, through either continuity in Navier-Stokes or through shells, um, can derive these velocity profiles. So let's talk about the Navier-Stokes equations, and in particular the x component and then we'll proceed with using it to derive a velocity profile as an example. So let's now put down the x component of Navier-Stokes. So let's put the x component of the Navier-Stokes equations down. So the very first term is rho, which is density, times the partial derivative of vx with respect to time. The second, uh, and then the second group of terms is density times a bunch of stuff in parentheses. So vx times the partial derivative of vx with respect to x. And then plus vy times the partial derivative of vx with respect to y plus vz times the partial derivative of vx with respect to z, close the bracket, and then this is equal to a bunch of stuff on the right hand side, mu times the second derivative, so it would be like d squared vx dx squared plus d squared dx dy squared plus d squared dx dz squared. And then we still have a couple more terms on the right hand side. We have uh, minus the partial derivative of pressure dp with respect to x 
And then in the very last term, we have a row times g with a, sub, uh, with a subscript x. So, so there we have it. So here are all of the terms. Here's the entire component of the x, or the, here's all of the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation. I'd just like to sort of indicate a couple of pairings of terms and just, just to sort of you know keep keep the x's and y's and z's straight, right? This is this is super messy. So because this is the x component, um, I'm gonna have x's in all of these terms right here. So that's so everything that I just underlined in orange is because this is the x component of the Navier Stokes equations. And then um, other pairings are sort of this term and this term right here, this term and this term right here, and this term and this term right here. So basically like, like vx is paired with this derivative with respect to x, this, uh, this is with this, this is with this. And sort of this term, we always have x, y's, and z's right here. But it's because it's the x component, we sort of have vx in all of these terms. But not not every velocity in this x component of Navier-Stokes is an x velocity, right? Sometimes we have um, y velocities and z velocities, and sometimes we have derivatives with respect to y and z. So we got to watch out for that. So just be aware. All right, so I'm going to now group out a handful of these terms. I'm going to kind of group chunks of these terms um, into, into groups, and then I'm going to explain like what each term physically means, like where it comes from. So I'm going to call this term A. I'm going to call this whole second bit term B. I'm going to call this term on the right-hand side. And now I'm going to call this term C. I'm going to call this dpdx term. I'm going to call this term D. And I'm going to call this last term 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 E. So here are all of the terms that we have in Navier-Stokes. So let's talk about where term A comes from. So if you remember, if you go back to what we were talking about um, earlier, this this Navier this x component of the Navier Stokes Stokes equation comes from conservation of momentum, right? And if we if we think about conservation of momentum, you know here uh, conservation of momentum basically had an accumulation term, you know, to, that described momentum accumulating inside of a control volume. It had an ins minus outs term, and it had a generation term. So essentially, external forces are what generate momentum in the control volume. We can have changes of momentum, you know, more momentum coming in one side than leaving the other, um, and we can have momentum, you know, accumulating within the control volume. And if we tie, uh, if we, you know, we can tie terms here to terms uh, to terms in this x component of Navier-Stokes equations. So if we think uh, if we think about this term a, this ver this very first term here essentially comes from it comes from the accumulation term um, or the unsteady term. And uh, essentially, the term in conservation of mass that had d dt of an integral over the control volume of, of v times rho dv. So, you know, why why is it kind of unsurprising here? Well, you know, there's like a rho and a velocity right here, um, and there and you know this we end up with a time derivative of this thing right here. Well, we have a time derivative right here, and we have density and velocity and stuff. And you know, so you can see, you know, hey, there's like like this is the term with the time derivative in it. This is the term with the time derivative in it. So it's unsurprising that this comes from here. What is the physical 
um, what is the physical interpretation of, of term A? Well, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, what is a derivative of velocity with respect to time? Well, if you differentiate velocity with respect to time, you know, uh, you, you end up with acceleration, right? So if we take a derivative of velocity with respect to y, then we get acceleration. Right, so if we think about this as acceleration, and if we think about conservation of momentum, conservation of momentum really comes from Newton's law, where essentially, you know, sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. You know, this is what we would interpret as a mass-like term, right? So, you know, density is kind of analogous to mass, and dvx dt is kind of analogous to acceleration, right? This is, a, in a sense, per unit volume, but, you know, but you get the gist of it, right? So if we're thinking about forces equals mass times acceleration, here's the mass times acceleration part of that. Um, or, or one part of the mass times acceleration uh, business, right? And, you know, maybe some of these other terms are really associated with forces. Finally, um, you know, what, what did, you know, um, how, how are you going to approach or use or deal with term A um, a lot of times? Well, if the problem is steady, or if the flow is steady, i.e. Ste you know, steady basically implies that you know, it, uh, things aren't changing with time. If you take a snapshot of it now and take a snapshot of it later, you have the same velocities in the same locations. So you know, if we have a, uh, a flow that's steady, term A, A is 0. So you can, you know, if, if some, some indication in the problem statement or some assumption allows you to say, hey, this flow is steady, term A goes out the window. Let's talk about term B now. So if we go back to conservation of momentum right here, um, you know, th we had this term that was kind of that kind of explained this term right here to some extent. We, we also had on our right hand side this integral over the surface and basically this, um, you know, this minus integral of v times rho times v dot n dA um, you know, essentially said, hey, if I have different, differing momentums coming in and out, um, then I'm going to have, um, you know, I'm going to need forces to account for the redirection of the momentum of fluid going in. So if we take ins minus outs and bring it to the left-hand side, if instead of ins minus outs, if you bring it over here, it's outs minus ins. And that's essentially what this term B is right here. So you can think of terms B, term B as outs minus ins in terms of, uh, of momentum. So what do I mean by outs minus ins? Well, imagine I had some fluid going in here and then some, some differing fluid coming out here. If these velocities were different, then I would have more momentum exiting and vers uh, or more momentum, like for example, entering versus exiting. Um, or exiting versus entry. So if these velocities differ, then, you know, if they differ, then dvx dx is non-zero. So, right, so if I have spatial variation in velocities, then my ins and outs are not balanced. So if velocity So if velocity varies spatially, then momentum ins and outs don't balance. And if your momentum ins and outs don't balance, then you need things like forces, like pressure or gravity or shear stress to account for or to cause that momentum imbalance, right? So if velocity varies spatially, then ins and outs don't balance. And what do I mean by velocity varying spatially? Um, if something varies spatially, then it's derivative with respect to x, or it's derivative with respect to y, or it's derivative with respect to z, is going to be non-zero. And that's basically what's showing up in this term, term b. I have x velocities, I, I ha or I could have, I have this x momentum, and this x velocity could vary with respect to x. It could vary with respect to y, or it could vary with respect to z. So 
What does that look like? All right, so let's let's look at two cases. Let's let's first look at how you know if something varies with respect to x. So imagine I have my little control volume that looks like this, and I have some slow velocity coming in and some fast velocity coming out. If this were the case, then dvx dx is greater than zero, and what would that mean? That this means I would need I would need to be applying some force to this control volume in order to make that that slowly moving flow that comes in come out a lot faster, right? So this basically means I need need some x force in order to make that happen. So if we have spatial variation, if we have a derivative of vx with respect to x, you know, then I'm going to need some force in order to account for that in order to account for the change of momentum uh, of fluid coming in, coming out versus coming in. Similarly, I could have spatial variations of vx with respect to y. So what does this mean? Well, let's imagine I had a control volume right here. And I had some fluid coming into the bottom and coming out of the top a little bit differently from one another. All right, so imagine I had, let's say, some vy as well as some vx on the bottom. And then, you know, let's say I had vy coming out of the top, but then a much bigger vx out of the top. Well, I have some x momentum that's kind of, right, if we think about the, if I have some x momentum that's kind of coming in the bottom, and then I have much more x momentum leaving the top, right? So if I have more, more x momentum leaving the top than leaving the bottom, then I'm going to need some x, I'm going to need some x force in order to make this change in momentum happen too, right? In order, you know, if I have fluid coming in the bottom and leaving out the top, then I'm going to need to be pushing, somehow pushing that fluid that comes in the bottom. I'm going to need to be pushing it to the right to make it exit with more momentum than it came in with. Right, so this, you know, so we can have vol velocities they sp spatially vary with x, or x velocity that spatially varies with y. And in either case, I would need some x force to get them going. And you can make a similar argument for z as well. So basically, what does it mean if I have if I have my x velocity that varies spatially? Then I'm going to need some force to account for that. Right. So if my momentum ins and my momentum outs don't balance, then it's accounted for. Then I'm going to need force to make it then I'm going to need force to make it happen so that's term b term b is essentially my in ins minus outs if it, were, it would be ins minus outs if we moved it over to this side or if we kept it on this side it's essentially outs minus ins which is the spatial variation so if we go back to the macro macro conservation of momentum. We've already dealt with this term, and we've already dealt with ter this term. So everything else in the Navier-Stokes equations is essentially the sum of external forces. So what do I mean? Basically, terms C, D, and E, all of these terms are essentially uh, external from the sum of the sum of external forces um, in this case. So basically all of these come from external forces. So when we think about external forces, when we think about external forces from in, in macro conservation problems, so in macro, in macro so in macro conservation of momentum, we basically said the sum of external forces came in four flavors. So we, we said, hey, these external forces can come in any number of ways. The external forces on our control volume, it can come from a force due to pressure. It can come from a force due to shear stress. It can come from a force due to gravity. And it could come from an externally applied force 
through solids that cross the surface of our control volume. So in this case, you know, in macro, in macro conservation of momentum, we had, uh, we had all of these terms here. So take a moment now, look at our x component of Navier-Stokes, and pause and ponder, pause and ponder, which of, which of these forces here do you think are paired with terms C, D, and E? All right, so hopefully you've had a minute to pause and ponder. Let's, uh, let's look at the, the easy ones first. Well, dp dx, a pressure gradient, unsurprisingly, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be term d, term d right here, right? Unsurprisingly, the, the, the Navier-Stokes equation term that involves pressure is going to be associated with the, the force due to pressure on a control volume. The term that involves g, this is gravitational acceleration. Um, you know, if, for example, we had a coordinate system where some or all of the x coordinate was aligned with gravity, then you know, then we'd have gravitational forces on our control volume. So in this case, term E, term E is there, um, and then unsurprisingly, the term with viscosity in it. Well, if you think about it, viscosity, there's that Newtonian constitutive relationship, which basically relates shear stress to a velocity gradient. Here we don't have exactly the same velocity gradient. We have something similar. Um, but you know, unsurprisingly, the term with viscosity is the term that involves shear stress. So this is term, term C right here. And for Navier-Stokes, we, we have this fully micro control volume that we basically shrunk to an almost infinitesimally small point. And this shrunk, shrinking it to an infinitesimally small point, um, it basically is entirely contained within the fluid. So because um, for micro, we don't have this term. So this term is not in the Navier-Stokes equations because our fully micro control volume is entirely within fluid. Um, so our so not, not in Navier-Stokes equations because our control volume entirely is entirely within the fluid. So now let's take a closer look at D or at C, D, and E, um, and you know sort of make make sense about you know what these derivatives mean and uh, and what's going on there. So let's actually, let's tackle the hard one first. Let's tackle term C here, All right? So term C, term C in our Navier-Stokes equations was mu d squared vx dx squared plus d squared vx dy squared plus d squared vx dz squared. So these are second second derivatives here. So let's let's some make let's make sense uh, for some of this. So we're already anticipating that this term C is coming from the shear stress, right? We have viscosity here. So recall for Newtonian fluids. For Newtonian fluids, there's this constitutive relationship, and you know so far you know we really. Um, the, you know, the only shear stress we really have talked a ton about in this class so far is like this tau yx, and we said this was equal to, tau yx was equal to minus mu times d vx dy. So what are some key differences between what we have here and what's going on here? Well, if you notice this, this is a first derivative. So we have a first derivative right here, where, whereas we have a second, a second derivative right here, and in this case, uh, so so that's a key you know a key difference between what we have here and here, and then the second thing is you know we have we have two other terms here, and you know um, we we just you know our shear stress relationship 
our, the only she real shear stress relationship that we've been using so far, you know, kind of only had this one term in it. So we need to explain We need to explain both things, what's going on. Why do we have second derivatives here instead of a first derivative here? And why do, you know, why do we have two more terms and, and, you know, instead of just this one term that we had been talking about historically for shear stress? So let's talk about, let's, let's talk about the fact that we have two more terms here first. And then we'll talk about this first derivative versus second derivative business. So regarding this whole thing with the two more terms, um, imagine I have this fully micro control volume right here. And of course, this control volume has six faces on it, right? So if I wanted to say, hey, you know, could there be shear stress? On, on these faces, there's shear, there could be shear stress on, on all of these faces potentially, right? So if I think about shear stress, um, the way shear stress was defined, you know, we said, hey, shear stress pointed left on the top and pointed right on the bottom using the, using the convention of the, tech, of the textbook for this class, right? But this one, let's define my, my coordinate system, x, y, Z, right, so if, if I look at this, this shear stress is just tau y x, um, and you know the shear, this shear stress can can apply forces in the x direction, but this isn't the only shear stress that can apply x forces on this chunk of fluid. Um, it turns out we can also have shear stress on this on this face too. Right? And this is what we might call tau, let's see, tau zx. Right? So, you know, we can have a tau yx, but we could also have shear stress on the front and back faces as well. And um, it's a little bit goofy, you know, I talked about like shear stress is sort of uh, tangent to the face, but normal to the face, you know, but it's, it's also hypothetical, it's also hypothetically possible to have um, a, a tau that's kind of normal to the faces here, right? So we can basically, you know, we can have a tau xx, even though, um, you know, we don't really see too much of that going on um, in, in in practical use for fluids, right? So so what does this mean? You know, we can have um, we can have shear stress not just on two opposite faces for a chunk, but we could have you know hypothetically shear stress on any face. Of, of our control volume. So that's basically why, you know, we can have, we don't always have just velocity gradients in Y, you know, or velocity gradients in X, or velocity gradients in Z, but we could hypothetically have velocity gradients in all three of those directions, and the velocity gradients in all three of those directions would contribute to, to shear stress. So because we could have shear stress on all six faces, we need, um, we need, uh, shear stress in all six faces corresponding to velocity gradients in all three directions, we need to have three terms involved in this force, um, forces in the x direction from shear stress. But, okay, so this explains why we need, you know, why we need three terms here instead of just this one term. It's because, you know, historically we've been, we only had shear stress or a velocity gradient in one direction. But, what do we need to deal with now? Well, we need to deal with this idea that, you know, there are two derivatives right here. You know, this is a second derivative right here, whereas we only had first derivatives for, for shear stress right here. So how do we make sense of what's going on right here? Well, let's just draw a side view of my control volume. So if I look at the side view of my control volume, I might say, hey, there's some, let's say there's some shear stress on the top, and then let's say there's some shear stress on the bottom, right? And uh, so take a moment now, pause and ponder. Um, if these are equal, is there any net force due to shear stress? Well, if these are equal, you know, one points in one direction, one points in the other direction. So if equal, there's no 
net force from this shear stress anyway. So, um, so we only get so so the the sort of the follow up to this is we only get we only get a net shear stress force if tau top does not equal tau bottom. So if I imagined a coordinate system here, let's say x and y, um, the follow-up to this thought, you know, if tau top equals uh, tau bottom, and we sort of made this control volume infinitesimally small delta y, we only get a net shear stress if delta tau delta y, right? So like the change in tau with respect to y is not zero. Or if we wanted to get all calculus -y on this, we only get a net force if the derivative of tau with respect to y is zero. But wait a second, I have this Newtonian relationship over here. So what can I do? I could plug this in right here. And again, I'm kind of I'm sweeping a little bit of the calculus complexity under the rug, but when I get this business here and I plug tau in here, I have a derivative of tau and but there's a derivative of velocity within tau. So when I take a derivative of a derivative, I get a second derivative, right? So, you know, when I take this derivative of tau with respect to y to account for a net shear stress force, when I get when I account for that net shear stress force, then I end up with like a mu and a second derivative of, for example, let's say vx with respect to y, right? So I get a second derivative when I plug something that had a first derivative into something that has another derivative. Of course, there are multiple derivatives in multiple directions here, and I'm kind of sweeping some of that complexity under the rug, um, you know, in the interest of, of time and focusing on the important stuff. But the key takeaway here is, you know, Shear stress is a first derivative of velocity, velocity, right? Shear stress is the velocity gradient, but it's only a gradient in shear stress that gives me a net force. So when I plug that in, I get a second derivative of velocity, a second spatial derivative of velocity. And basically, second derivatives of velocity are what give me net shear stress forces. Right? So it's second. So second derivatives of velocity um, give me net shear stress forces. What does a second derivative of velocity mean? A second derivative of a velocity basically means curvature in the velocity in the velocity profile. So for example, when we solve the problem with flow in a pipe, remember how we got a parabolic velocity profile? Well, there's this parabolic velocity profile. There's a lot of curvature in that velocity profile. And the curvature in that velocity profile basically meant there was um, net forces due to shear stress on, on a micro control volume. So that's the key takeaway here. So, oof, complex I know, but what's, 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 the, you know, what's, the, what's the basic key takeaway? This is the shear stress term right here. Why do we have second derivatives? Well, because shear stress is a first derivative and we get net forces from a spatial variation of a spatial variation. So now let's talk about term D. We talked about term C, now let's talk about term D, which is a net force due to pressure. So we have a we have a net force due to pressure. So where does this um, you know how do we talk about ec net x forces due to pressure? Well, imagine I sort of had the side view of my control volume, my micro control volume again, and I have my x y coordinates. Well, imagine I have some pressure on one face and some pressure on the other face. 
Well, if you think about it, um, if the, let's say I have some pressure here, you know, and some pressure here, um, they could both be of a really high magnitude, they could both be of a really low magnitude, so it's not really the pressure, you know, the pressure itself doesn't, doesn't really result in any net force, right? If I just crank up the pressure, you know, in general, then I'd crank up the, the magnitudes of the forces on both sides, right? So magnitude of pressure right, so magnitude of pressure doesn't matter for net force on my micro control volume, right? I could, I could make both of these a really strong pressure or both of these a really tiny pressure, both of these even a negative pressure, and it just wouldn't matter, right? So the magnitude of the pressure doesn't matter for the net force on the CV. Um, it only matters if the pressure on one side is different on the other, right? So it only, I only get a net force on my micro control volume if one of these pressures is different from the other. Right, so what does this mean? Well, as in the case that I've drawn here, I might say dp, part, like the partial derivative of pressure with respect to x. In this case, I would say my partial derivative of pressure with respect to x is greater than zero, and that would imply that my, my x pressure force is is negative basically if, if my if my pressure gradient if my pre if pressure is increasing in the x direction then I'm going to get a negative x force on um, you know uh, on on this control volume right then I'm basically you know if I have more pressure on this face than this then you know then I'm pushing it then I'm pushing myself I'm pushing myself to the left from pressure so um, so what is you know so what what's the interpretation here well that's why there's this minus sign up front, right? If dp dx is positive, then pressure is pushing me in the um, in the negative x direction. So, so that's what's going on right there. So that's the pressure term. It's not absolute pressure that matters in any sense, but pressure gradients. And, it, and basically, if the pressure gradient is positive, then that's associated with the net pressure force in the, um, in the negative x direction, hence minus sign right here. So last but not least, let's talk about term E, which is rho gx. So term E, which was rho times g sub x. Um, if you sort of, if you look at all this, you know, all this stuff, all the things in this equation, you know, for term A, you know, we said it was this like um, you know, mass mass times uh, you know mass times acceleration term. Well, it wasn't really mass; it was sort of mass per unit volume, right? Because density is you know kilograms per cubic meter. So, in a sense, you know, this term is like the mg gravitational term, right? So it's like like mass times g, but this accounts for a couple of things, right? It's really like mass per unit volume. As is, you know, as are all the all the terms in Navier-Stokes equations, and it's you know the idea that you know maybe it's not the full g, but really just whatever, whatever if any component of the gravitational acceleration vector is in the positive x direction, right? So for example, when we solved when we did the shells problem, where we had our blood oxygenator that was at you know some angle alpha, where and g was pointing down like this, you know we had blood that was kind of pumped up and trickled down this ramp. Well, you know some component of g, some component of g 
was in was in the positive x direction, right? If we defined our since we define for this problem, we defined our coordinate system to be like x, y, like this, right? So in this case, some component of g was in the x direction. So in this, you know, so for this problem, g g x was basically equal to g um, times the sine sine of alpha. So here we are. We've now explained all of the terms in the Navier-Stokes equation. Take a moment now, pause and ponder what, if any, assumptions to use the Navier-Stokes equations. What, if any, equations? So pause and ponder. What, if any, assumptions are required to use the Navier-Stokes equations? Oh, perhaps you paused and pondered and done it? It turns out that barely any. This actually works even if the fluid is compressible, even if you have non-homogeneous densities. This works even if you have turbulence. This works even if you have friction in your flow. The only assumption that's required is where we brought in this term mu here and where we talked about having where we talked about having shear stress in our equation. The only assumption was that the fluid is Newtonian, where we basically used this relationship behind the scenes to get right here. So the only the only assumption the only one required to use the Navier-Stokes equation is that we're dealing with the Newtonian. The only assumption is that we're dealing with the Newtonian fluid. So that's, I mean, that's pretty great, right? A lot of, almost every equation we've used so far has had some pretty serious assumptions built in. This one actually has like almost the least restrictive equation that we've dealt with, uh, the least restrictive assumption that we've dealt with so far. But, you know, getting back to the million dollars that we're leaving on the table here, this is not an easy equation. This is not an easy equation to solve. And in fact, this is only one of them, right? This is only the x component of the Navier-Stokes equations. There's a y component and a z component as well. And a lot of times we need to also throw in conservation of mass on top of it as well. Right? So what does it mean? You know, very rarely do we look, uh, you know, in, in real life, you know, it's never just one component of Navier-Stokes that matters. You know, all th you know con we have conservation of mass or conservation of momentum in all directions that, you know, that governs our physical reality. Um, and so solving this equation um, as part of a system of three Navier-Stokes equations is non-trivial. So what does it mean? Um, there's also there's also y momentum and z momentum for Navier-Stokes equations, and they look they look similar in this to some ways, except some of the x's are swapped out for y's or z's, but some of the x's and y's and z's are still kept here. Um, I won't go through all of them now. Instead, I'll, I've posted a document to the course website that has um, that has the the x, y, and z components of Navier-Stokes in it. Furthermore, um, you know this we've worked out conservation of momentum in an x, y, z right in the, in Cartesian coordinates. But you know, thinking about but like you know, what if you wanted to do flow in a pipe, right? Well, you know, I guess we could do x, y, and z for this, but you know, it gets a little tricky to apply boundary conditions when you have a circular boundary and, you've, and you're working in Cartesian coordinates. So there's also a version in cylindrical coordinates that basically has a v, z, a v, sorry, a v, z, a v, r, and a v, theta. 
right? And this is good for like flow in pipes. There's also a version in spherical coordinates, which is useful for, for example, if you're dealing with like flow around a cell. Um, you know, if you're like looking at like cells settling um, or, you know, flow around um, some, you know, some body moving in fluid, you know, you might say, hey, if I'm looking for flow around a sphere, it might be useful to use spherical coordinates, right? So, you know, there's Y and Z momentum in Cartesian coordinates. There's also a version in cylindrical coordinates that has three, three equations, one for VZ, one for VR, and one for V theta. There's also one for spherical coordinates that basically has like a VZ, a V theta, and a V phi as well. So, um, and you know, your choice of which, which coordinate system to, uh, to build your Navier-Stokes around is obviously very problem specific, right? You know, whether you're dealing with flow in a pipe or, you know, some other flow. Um, so this is not trivial as well. Um, and, you know, if, if you think the Cartesian one is messy, you know, just take a look at the cylindrical and spherical coordinates and yikes, whew, it's tricky. Um, so what did I say? I said you could win a million bucks if you got, if you proved that there's some unique solution to the full set of Navier-Stokes equation for any possible flow. Um, but, and that's a hard problem, that's a million dollar problem. But we can get solutions to this for some particular flows where we make, we make additional assumptions in, order, uh, in addition to this Newtonian fluid. So what's the key takeaway? Navier-Stokes are messy. They're hard, they're messy. But in, in certain simple geometries, additional assumptions Uh, will allow us cr to cross off most terms, and once we, and if we cross off most terms, that might give us a simpler partial differential equation. A nice solution. And with this in mind, you know, this hard, messy, like this super hard, messy differential equation, sometimes simple geometries will allow us to cross off most of the terms. And if we cross off most of the terms, we might end up with a differential equation that is perhaps simple enough to be able to solve, get some pen and paper solution. And what do I mean by a nice solution? I mean, uh, we're able to derive a velocity profile. Woohoo! So let's go ahead. Let's do this. Let's try this for uh, for a particular flow. So let's try this. Let's go ahead and try this for a simple flow. All right, so what simple flow am I talking about? Well, it's actually one of the first flows that we approached at the very beginning of this class. Let's look at the flow where I have the ground right here. And then I have a plate up here. And I'm pulling this plate with some known velocity. V. So I'm, I'm tugging this top plate with some known velocity V, and I know the distance between the top plate and the bottom plate is some constant H. And I'm going to assume uh, a handful of things. Right, so we're going to assume we have some Newtonian fluid. Some Newtonian fluid kind of filling this gap. Right, so, you know, what is this problem? I have some, you know, the stationary ground, I have some top plate that I'm tugging along with some velocity v. And let's say I'm curious, you know, what is the velocity profile 
um, in this in this system here. So I guess I could define a coordinate system. Let's say y and x. My goal is to define is to find, you know, what is the velocity profile of the flow in here. So essentially, what is vx as a function of y? That's my goal is to derive this. So if, let's assume we have some Newtonian fluid with some known viscosity mu um, in between here. Let's assume that where um, these plates are large and horizontal. Right? For example, like gravity is in this direction right here. Um, let's assume that the, we have a, um, an, inc a, a, an incompressible homogeneous fluid, i.e. constant density. And let's assume that the flow is laminar. Um, and and that's that, right? So let's use these set of assumptions. You know, strictly speaking, to use Navier-Stokes, all we need is is this assumption here. But we're going to need a handful of assumptions in order to uh, in order to make any progress in terms of crossing out um, these. So um, we've you know we've kind of collected our problem together. We've made some assumptions. You know, some some things given to us. Um, let's proceed with using Navier-Stokes to solve this. So when when I'm when I'm building problems like this and when I'm thinking you know hey like which you know which component of Navier Stokes is going to be useful to solve this problem well the um, the most useful component of Navier you know we strictly we have x momentum z y momentum and z momentum with Navier Stokes usually the most useful one is the direct is the what is the direction that involves the velocity profile that we're looking for. So because we're looking for an x velocity, x momentum will be useful. Right, so the x momentum Navier Stokes will be useful. So with that in mind, with that in mind, let's let's put down x momentum right here. All right, so here we have density times dvx dt plus vx times dvx dx plus dy times dvx dy plus vz times dvx dz. And that's the left-hand side. And we can say that this is this whole thing is equal to the right hand side. And I'm going to change around the order of some of the terms in the right hand side. Let's just say it's minus dp dx plus rho times g sub x plus mu times d squared dx dx squared plus d squared dx dy squared plus d squared dx dz squared. So there's the x component of, of Navier-Stokes. So, oh, let's add one more assumption here uh, before, I, before I get started. Let's assume that we're dragging this plate along. You know, here I was given this v. Let's assume that you know, we've been dragging it along at v for a while, so we're in steady in steady state. So if we're in steady state, which of these terms can you can we cross off? Perhaps pause and ponder. What does steady allow us to cross off? Well, if we think about steady, steady implies that any time derivative is, is zero. So we can cross off terms here. And just for your you for your sake, um, anytime you do a Navier Stokes problem, I'm going to expect you to write down the full Navier-Stokes, list out your assumptions, and then when you cross off each term, tie the crossing off of that term to some particular assumption. All right, so this term here, we can't quite make progress on this yet 
um, if I'm pulling along this uh, this plate here, you know, moving this plate here, if I have this, if I assume the flow is laminar, then I'm expecting if I, I'm expecting my velocities to just be moving like this. And you know, if if my flow is laminar, right? If I don't have flow kind of swirling around and sort of having all of these turbulent eddies, then my laminar flow with this with with this particular problem of the plate being dragged along like this you know the combination of laminar flow and sort of large horizontal plates basically tells me you know these these two assumptions to get together essentially tell me that i should assume that my y velocity is zero right because basically you know unless i have flow sort of swirling around between the plates um, i'm not having any any velocity come out of the top or go into the bottom so as long as these plates are large and you know I don't have fluid sneaking in one end or leaving out the you know leaving out the other end, um, you know my vy my vy should be zero. So um, so what does that mean? You know here I basically can get rid of this term here by assume you know by assuming that my y velocity is zero everywhere, and I could make the same argument for z as well. You know these large plates. I don't. I'm not having anything coming into or out of the page right here. Let's also assume that if I have this end of it, you know, this end of my plate exposed to atmospheric pressure as this end, you know, if I have atmospheric pressure on both sides of the plate, you know, I'm not really having pressure drive this flow. It's just the dragging of the top plate. So I, mean, I guess I could explicitly state that assumption, but we assume there's no externally applied pressure. And if I basically you know, don't have any difference in the pressure on either sides of this whole thing, then you know, there's basically no there's no pressure driving the system as well. If I think about this term right here, I said this this these plates are horizontal, you know, so if gravity's pointing in this direction, then I'm not ha then, you know, there's no g sub x going on. All right. So, so there we have it. Um I also think, you know, this this large plates this large plates um assumption um and laminar flow basically mean that it's not it's not just vz that's zero but sort of I, I think we can anticipate that basically nothing is varying in z so you know the large plates you know vz is zero but also the derivative of kind of anything with respect to z derivative you know we could put whatever we want here but we basically have no z variation you know so we can kind of assume you know it's not just dvx but also you know if if the first derivative of anything with respect to z is zero then its second derivative is zero as well so you know, no z, no z variation. I think could safely be assumed. So what does this mean? You know, yes, Navier-Stokes is messy, but with you know a couple of reasonable assumptions for a flow whose geometry is relatively simple and we don't have turbulence in it, you know, we can actually cross off a uh, a ton of these terms right here. Now it turns out we usually can't cross off quite all of the terms dealing with just x momentum by itself often we also need continuity so and if and if we're talking about continuity we assumed we had some incompressible homogeneous fluid we could use the the simpler version of continuity right here that's dvx dx plus dvy dy plus dvz dz is equal to zero. So then what, so what are we going to need to do here? Well, um, we're going to use continuity to draw conclusions about some of this stuff, about some of the terms in x momentum to get what is already a simplified equation even more simple. So we're going to need continuity uh, to cross off even more. So we're going to take you. We're going to use continuity to cross off even bit more. So we basically said, hey, there's no z variation. So that means dvz dz there is is zero. 
We also said we were assuming that Vy was equal to zero from basically impermeable plates on the top and bottom, right? And laminar flow. So what does this mean? We can now conclude this is zero. And if we conclude dvx d, dx is zero, we can also assume that d squared vx dx squared is zero. Because that's because that's basically saying that it's d dx of zero, right? D d squared vx dx squared is essentially the same is essentially the derivative of this with respect to x. And if this is zero, then its derivative is also zero. So what does that mean? We can basically get rid of this from continuity. And we can also get rid of this from continuity. So what does this mean? We basically obliterated all of these terms except for this one term right here. So what does it mean? We basically, you know, through through some reasonable assumptions and from the continuity equation, we were able to get rid of most of the terms in x momentum except for one key term which is going to help us derive what this velocity profile is. So what are we left with? We're basically left with, I mean we have a mu out front here, but you know if then I divide everything by mu, I'm basically left with 0 is equal to d squared vx dy squared. So the, the second partial derivative of vx with respect to y, which is basically saying, you know, hey, how, what is the curvature of this velocity profile? So let's see if we can solve this differential equation. So we said, you know, hypothetically, vx is some function of x, y, z, and time, right? You know, in general, velocities can be functions of all those four things. And we said, you know, last time when we were solving shells problems, we said, hey, you know, if, if vx is, could be a function of all these things, but we're able to assume that it's not a function of a lot of these things, and we're able to narrow it, narrow these four variables down to just one, then we'll be able to replace partial derivatives with ordinary derivatives. So let's see what we can do there. Well, um, we, if we think about vx being a function of x, it actually can't be because from continuity, we said dvx dx was zero, right? So from, so from continuity, we said dvx dx was equal to zero. And if the partial derivative of vx with respect to zero, if the partial derivative of vx with respect to x is zero, it basically, that's equivalent to saying that vx is not a function of x. Right? If vx is not a function of x, then its partial derivative is zero. Why? Let's leave that in there for now. But here, you know, vx, can this be a function of z? No. We assumed that there was no z variation. Variation right here. And can vx be a function of time? No because we assumed that it was steady. So what does that mean? That leaves only y that vx could be a function of. So if vx is only a function of y, then from this reasoning here, we can basically replace partials with ordinary derivatives. So what does that mean? That basically is saying dvx dy squared is equal to zero. So now we have a second derivative of vx with respect to y. This is a differential equation that we can solve, right? So what can we do? If we integrate once, then we get, on the left-hand side, we get dvx dy is equal to, you know, and then we integrate the right-hand side, we get a constant of integration. So we get a plus c. Because I anticipate integrating um, twice, I'm just going to name these constants two separate things. I'm going to call this first one c1. Then I can integrate both sides. Again, when I integrate this, I get vx. When I integrate this, I get c1 
my, uh, my as of yet unknown constant of integration times y plus then I get another another get uh, another constant of integration from integrating again so I can integrate again So we had a second derivative, we integrated it once and got a constant of integration on the right hand side, we integrate it again. Um, when we integrate a constant with respect to y, we get y. When we integrate this derivative, we get vx, and we get another constant of integration that we have here. So how do we resolve constants of integration? Well, we resolve them via boundary conditions about this flow. So we resolve We resolve this via boundary conditions. And if I think about my coordinate system here, well, what is my velocity at x equal, at y equals zero? My velocity, my x velocity at y equals zero should be zero. My x velocity at y equals h should be capital V here. So what is this, what is it, what is this saying? The x at y equals zero is gonna be equal to zero. The x at y equals h is equal to V, the velocity of the plate. This is capital V, velocity of the plate. Basically saying the particles, the particles of fluid need to be moving um, immediately adjacent to these solid things need to basically be moving with them. So that's this right here. So what does this mean? We can basically plug, plug this into this equation and this into this equation. When we plug the first one in, we get zero is equal to C1 times 0 plus c2. And when we plug the second one in, we get v is equal to c1 times h plus c2. Well, from this first one, we can see pretty, pretty readily that this means that c2 is equal to 0. And then when we sub C2 equals equal to zero in this equation here, then we end up with um, C1 is equal to V over H. We can then take this and we can plug this back into this equation here to get our much desired velocity profile. So now Vx as a function of Y is basically V over H times y. There we have it. So we started with the messiest of all partial differential equations. We started with a million dollar differential equation. And although there's a million dollar proof out there for a general solution to this differential equation, we were able to get a, so a flow specific solution to this differential equation by making a handful of assumptions that allowed us to cross off a handful of terms and by roping in continuity we were able to cross out even more. We ended up with a partial differential equation that we were able to conclude through our assumptions that we could replace these partial derivatives with ordinary ones. We integrated twice, we got some unknown constants of integration which we resolved with boundary conditions when we applied those boundary conditions, we ended up getting a not too messy solution, which was our much desired velocity profile. And this was this linear velocity profile, you know, that we that we had during some of the first lectures of this class. But it's nice to know that Navier-Stokes equations gives us this familiar result. So hopefully uh, you've enjoyed this lecture and learned some, some, some stuff about fluid mechanics. So good luck with your studies. Thanks for watching.